welcome and thanks for tuning in to the Victorian Aboriginal News Van Talks podcast. I'm your host, Charles Parkiner. Victorian Aboriginal News acknowledges and pays respect to traditional owners and custodians across Australia. We acknowledge the elders who have gone before, those who currently lead their communities and those who will follow in years and generations to come. It was in 1985 that Gunajamara man Uncle Jim Berg, along with barrister the late Aaron Caston and jurist Ron Merkel, sued the University of Melbourne and the Museum of Victoria for the return of Indigenous cultural material collections. The resulting success of that action was the founding of the Koori Heritage Trust. Located now in Melbourne's Federation Square precinct, the Trust is often regarded as the go-to place to purchase First Nations gifts and artworks. But in keeping with its origins, it is significantly more than just that. Joining me today to talk about this and the Trust in general is Kulkagal and Kama Kama Merriam man Tom Mosby, CEO of the Trust. Tom, welcome to the program and thanks for joining me today. Now, my pleasure. Very pleased I can do this. <laughs> and in person as <laughs> in well, person which is a break well. from what we've done in the past. Yep. Tom, let's just look a bit more about the origins of the Koori Heritage Trust because people don't understand that, but those origins really speak to the very spirit of the place. Mm. As the CEO, give us what you would normally explain to people as the origins. Um, Look, the origins of the trust, as you mentioned, and even the name trust, it was about actually holding in trust for Victorian, and it's actually broader than Victorian because, I mean, it's beyond the borders that were set post-colonial. So we're talking really Southeast Australian, Aboriginal communities, culture that crosses into New South Wales and into South Australia as well. So the trust was really set up to protect the cultural heritage and cultural material coming out of this region of Australia. And it was very much about stopping things also being sold overseas. One of the things that Uncle Jim and the two Ronnies, as they were known, it was also (laughs) about the um, skeletal remains that were being collected and taken overseas as well. So it was really about ensuring that Victorian, Southeast Australian Aboriginal um, culture was kept and held in trust for the community. So the big thing is that As I mentioned in the introduction, a lot of people think, well, if we want to get a First Nations gift, we'll go to the Koori Heritage Mm. Trust. But it's a heck of a lot more than that. It's a bit like the iceberg. The the little tip you Mm. see really Mm. hides the rest of it. So what is the rest of it? What does this place actually hold? Well, I think I'll turn it the other way because the shop and um, the gifts that you can actually buy at the Trust, it's actually a small part of the much bigger thing um, and bigger things that we do at the Trust. So one of the key things, we are an um, art and cultural organisation, so it's actually about showcasing the material heritage of Victorian, South East Australian Aboriginal communities. But we also say now First Peoples because it's also recognising that there's been Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islanders from Correct. around Australia that moved to Victoria, that now call Victoria home. Their sort of descendants are now living down here. Mm. So this is really about representing First Peoples people's art and culture in Southeast Australia. For us, we do it through our exhibitions program. We also do it through our collection. So we have an amazing collection which just focuses on the art and cultural heritage of Southeast Australia. We also have education programs. We do tours and walking tours along the river, the Birrarung yep. River, the Yarra. We do cultural awareness training. We also have a very important Koori Family History Service, which is about genealogical research and about connecting the stolen generation back to community. So all of that really is the the work that um, other work that we do. On top of that, we then have our retail. So people can come visit us, but yeah. at the same time, they can actually take a gift away with them. What about researchers? I mean, we typically think about collections mm. as being enormously valuable resources mm. for researchers, academics, and even journalists. Mm. Is that 
something that this place provides? Oh, very much so. So our collection dates back to 1985. Um, there was a, the gift of a grinding stone that was given to Uncle Jim. Yeah. And so out of that grew the collection that we now have. And in the collection, we have material from the 19th century, some fantastic. We have great William Barrick watercolour from the oh. 19th century. We have shields by Barrick as well, but right up to very contemporary. So we're always collecting. And I think Think, and it's all Victorian, like I mentioned, Victorian material culture. So it's a great resource for researchers, but also for our First Nation, First People artists living in Victoria who are wanting to reconnect with material that come out of their community, but also looking at the design and style that is unique to down here. One of the big things that we're really keen on promoting is when you come to Victoria, there's a living Aboriginal culture down here that is different to the Northern Territory, Very to much. Western Australia, to yep. Queensland. People still think Aboriginal art is dot painting <laughs> and we continually struggle with that. That's a hoary that. old topic, it that is, one. It is. And so for us, it is actually about promoting the fact that and supporting our artists to actually, for them to be developing their own personal style, but looking at the design that's unique to this area as well. I just want to bring you back. You made mention of Uncle William Barrack's work mm. and some of his stuff that you're actually holding here. That then brings to mind the question, well, what's the relationship then with traditional owners right across Victoria? Because Uncle William's work is very highly regarded mm. within the Wadangeri Woiwurrung, and as a lot of our listeners know, in 2023, there was a huge success mm. with getting some of that artwork mm. back. Mm. So what is the relationship that the Trust has with traditional owner groups, and what are some of the challenges? Mm. So, I mean, the relationship for us, it is about representing all of Victoria. Yeah. So it's about actually showcasing and collecting material from around the state so that when a particular community, they can visit us, they can actually see what's in our collection. And that's a very important part of the work we do. It's about that representation. It's a broader representation. Mm. It's also about acknowledging that when we have visitors coming into Melbourne and whether they're from interstate or internationally, they don't have time to go into the regional sector. We would want to represent as much as we can the regional sector physically here at the Trust, but hopefully digitally, virtually online, that people then can explore much broader with the, all of the different um, parts of the state and the different communities we have here. The difficulty we have is being able to actually physically be able to engage and go out into community yeah. and do things with community as well. We try as much as we can to get community into the trust, but we need to be out there and doing more in the community as well. Well, you've made mention of the fact that you're trying to provide a representation, I'm going to paraphrase your work, but mm -hmm. a representation of all the cultures right across Victoria. Mm. And just as there are different cultures across Australia, there mm. are within Victoria mm. as well. So how do you do that? I mean, how many people have you got on the ground? Because you would certainly need a small army out there well, constantly, one would imagine. Exactly. And that is part of the, um, I suppose, the difficulty that we have in being able to connect with all of our communities within Victoria. We're a small organisation at the end of the day. Mm. Um, we only have, I think, 28 people. And that's include casuals and part-timers. So it's a very small team we're working with. And to be able to actually get more of ourselves into the regional community, because we'd love to actually take our collections out into the regional communities as well, but we just don't have the resource to be able to do that. Is that a call out to the state government for more resources? <laughs> it definitely is a call out to the state government for more resources. But it is. I mean, it's also it's financial, but it's also getting more staff on board, supporting more staff, supporting more of our mob to actually come in that we can train up as curators, as tour guides, or even just putting them um, front of house, working in front of house, um, Vista Experience, retail in the shop as well. We still struggle in terms of building that workforce and being able to actually support that workforce as well. Has there been a change in the direction or the, the, the focus of the Koori Heritage Trust since, let's say, 2018, since we've had advancing the Treaty Act introduced mm. by the state government, the formation of the First People's Assembly of Victoria, the York Justice Commission, more recently mm. the Treaty Authority? 
Has this had an impact at all on the Koori Heritage Trust? It has. Uh, yes and no. I mean, look, going back to when we first started... God, 32, 31, 32 years ago, mm. the original intent of the trust was about preserving and protecting. It was very much looking at a sort of historical legacy that we needed to, and quite rightly, we needed to actually preserve and protect. Of course. We've moved on from there because I think the work that the trust put in in those early days, we're now at a stage where we're more about celebrating what we have in Victoria. It's about nurturing, promoting, supporting, celebrating. And so we've consciously changed the words in our sort of vision statement to reflect that. I think with what's happening with treaty, reconciliation, all of that, all of the work that we're doing in that space of promoting and supporting really fits into supporting the treaty process, supporting reconciliation. So let's talk about this change from preserving and protecting, which still is obviously a core Mm. basis of of the organisation, but now the celebration. Mm. What role do you see that the Koori Heritage Trust has in promoting understanding of First Mm. Nations across Victoria, or First Nations full stop, uh, reconciliation and self-determination. I think we have a key role physically where we're located. I mean, we're in a very accessible part of the city. We're at Federation Square. It's easy for people to actually come to us and to Federation Square. We're more visible. So when you have your sort of tourist, international, um, interstate tourists coming in, people coming to Federation Square, walking past, they f- find the Koori Heritage Trust. Mm. It's far easier for people to actually locate us and to actually then engage with us in the work that we do. So by being physically located in this very central place, it's actually much easier for people to actually come to the trust. As soon as they walk through the door, it's it's an educational experience. We're in a building that was built 20 odd years ago, Mm. but when we took over the building, part of what we wanted to do was to work with Indigenous architects. G for Greenway is one of the key ones. At the time, Ruben Berg, Uncle Jim's son, he was also one of the architects as well. It was really about reflecting in the interior space a very contemporary... It was reflecting Victorian Aboriginal design values but in a contemporary sense so people walk in the door the first thing that they see is this sort of interior space that reflects victorian contemporary design then they come through they actually have exhibitions that they can look at temporary exhibitions we have our permanent collection on display One of the things we're very keen on moving forward with as well is the use of language, and especially looking at the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung language, given we're on um, Wurundjeri land, use of language in our wayfinding, in our signage, even in our welcome. So everything for us is about educating people coming in about Victorian Aboriginal people and communities. Have you noticed that over the years there has been an increase in the interest in tourists, local and international, in yeah, your work? Definitely. There's been a definite increase in that interest and a willingness and wanting to learn as well. School groups coming through. I think as a 30-year-old organisation, I mean, we were having school groups coming through 30 years ago. Mm. And those kids are now in their 30s. And I think those kids have had that engagement and long engagement with um, Aboriginal communities, with Aboriginal values and culture that they, I would like to think, are passing that on to their children. And so for us, we've certainly seen that. In line with that, I'm aware that the Koori Heritage Trust actually provides cultural education services. Tell us a little bit about that and how that's been growing and also plays to this educating community. Mm. So one of the key services that we provide is a cultural awareness training program, Mm. which we actually provide to government, to corporates, to organisations, but also to individuals as well. And it's grown over the years and it's very successful in terms of that delivery and about educating people as well. The program is very much about if you want to actually work with Aboriginal people or just understand Aboriginal people better, This is a program you do because looking at the history, post-settlement history in um, Victoria, colonisation, 
the legacies of colonisation, all of that influences our Aboriginal people, our communities today. And for people wanting to work with Aboriginal employees or with colleagues, this really sets an understanding for those organisations, for people as well. Have you noticed a difference in attitudes of people coming in to undertake this training from a degree of reluctance to believe that there was this horror yeah. that took place in sort of the 1800s? Mm. Oh no, we've certainly seen that. We see people coming in without any idea of the history and the legacy of colonisation and they leave the program at the end of the day and they're just blown away. We've also seen people come in and to be perfectly honest, people come in and they're very reluctant to recognise that as well. So it's an interesting thing for us to actually see that. And those type of participants, I mean, we don't get them that often, but it's still out there and I think It basically means, I mean, our work will never be done for any of us, actually, that we will always be having having to deal with people who just don't want to accept that the history and the legacies of what happened to our people back then still impacts on us today. How do you see this particular service, this core service of the Trust, evolving over the next, say, five to ten years? Because especially with the... The information coming out from the Europe Justice Commission, which is incredibly stark, mm. that's got to be shaping the work you're doing and the future direction. Mm. I think for us, it, 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 I don't see it in terms of the workshop. It, it wouldn't evolve really the workshop, but the work that we do in things like our family history service, it becomes really important because there's a lot of people that are still... I mean, you know, the stolen generation, we've talked about the stolen generation since the apology, all of that. And this can only bring out more of people that have been removed from families, have been removed from community, identifying and bringing them back to their self-identity. And I think things like that, that will be evolving in programs like our family history service i think what we do in that space will be very important with the justice commission Mm. and the work that's being done in that area let's talk about the security of the koori heritage trust Mm. because it was under a bit of a dark shadow a while ago Mm. i think it was looming under the shadows of a potential apple store oh (laughs) (laughs) we had to talk about that because the reality is that now the koori heritage trust occupies this entire Mm. yarra building it's a yarra building which was changed to the birrung so um, at the start of the year we completed our expansion program to actually take all three floors and in recognition of that but also in recognition of the fact that that we've moved beyond Federation because, I mean, the square is still called Federation Square. Yeah. And so all of the buildings were named at the time from the Federation era. But surprisingly, so we were in the Yarra building. It didn't take much of a move to actually go to <laughs> Fed Square and to government to say, actually, why not just change to the bearing? It's still the same meaning, but you're actually putting it into language and just the change from English into language is such a powerful recognition of country and place, traditional ownership. Yeah, so we're very proud, very excited to actually be in this physical building here at Fed Square. Now that you've got the three floors, and I know everyone's really proud about that, but given the growth of the Koori Heritage Trust since 1985... Mm. Do you really believe that this is going to be fit for purpose in, say, 20 years' time? No, no, I have still have ambitions. I've been in this role (laughs) for about 12 years. I want to set up the legacy for the next person coming in to actually just go much further in terms of the physical space. So I've got my eye, there's a rooftop that we have. I mean, I'm imagining an amazing Indigenous garden on the rooftop oh, wow. where we can actually have a camping experience for, you know, our school In the kids, middle of Nam. In the m- middle of Nam, on oh, top of the goodness. roof. Our kids coming down from the country, they can actually camp up here in a safe space. There's a floor below us, which is a, currently a restaurant, which I'm thinking I would love to take that as well. So I've got my three floors, but I still there's still blue skies to actually look at. So what do you have downstairs? Would you have Mabu Mabu moving downstairs? No, no, we'll keep Mabu Mabu. It's actually below it. So there's another level actually below the ground level, oh, which right. looks out onto the river. So if we can actually take that, I think it would be fantastic. Well, let me be really blunt with this question. Mm. What do you need to achieve? 
achieve these lofty ambitions, and they're pretty lofty. They are very lofty. But what do you need? I think, well, of course, money. <laughs> we need money at the moment. We're actually a tenant of Fed Square, but it's really not money. It's actually looking at okay, how can government support Fed Square to actually give us what we need in terms of the building? Yeah. So, I mean, it's similar to. You know, the National Gallery of Victoria, ACME, they all pay a very peppercorn rental and it's money sort of coming from the government that they pay back to the government. Something similar, I think, for the trust, which would help us a lot in terms of our lease would be amazing because it means we can really focus on developing our programs, developing our services, building the collection Which is an important thing because, I mean, that's a legacy for not even for the state but for our community is to make sure we continue to build that collection for future generation. The one thing I didn't talk about is we also have an amazing oral history collection. So we've been collecting oral history from elders, from communities, I think from the um, early days as well. So we've got this amazing repository of oral history that will be a real asset for future generation for our community. And talking about the treaty process, Mm. that's one thing. That's one of their programs that they're doing, is doing all of these oral recordings. We've actually spoken to them about depositing all of that with us so that we hold it in trust for future generations as well. So there's all of this other work to be done that the trust can really be a core part of. Given that we on this program really like to issue calls to action to the greater community, and that's black, white and every shade in between, what would you like to see community do to support the work of the Koori Heritage Trust, apart from coming in and frequenting the place, but by way of lobbying local politicians? What do you want to see? I think, look... The core thing for us is for people to actually come in. I really want to see more people engaged with us, engaging with us. So coming in, seeing our collections, seeing our exhibitions, taking our walking tour, doing our cultural awareness training, going to the shop. But even because we do a lot of public programming with Fed Square into the square itself. So we have for NADOC week coming up, we're having a NADOC week market or a NADOC market that will be on the Friday of the March and also on the Saturday. Come in and actually join us and celebrate with us. And every year at the end of the year, we do a Koori Christmas in the square itself. So yep. we have a Koori Claws that come in. We also have a Koori Market that um, over that sort of period where people can actually buy from local designers, artists. They all take stalls. I, we just, I really encourage people to come in and engage with us in that way. Vote with your feet and with your wallet, folks, yep. I think is Definitely. what it boils down <laughs> to. What we'll be doing on the Victorian Aboriginal News website to accompany this interview with Tom Mosby is we'll be providing a link back to the Koori Heritage Trust website so you can see exactly what's going on because there is always something happening here at the Koori Heritage Trust. Tom Mosby, CEO of Koori Heritage Trust, thank you so much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you. For a full transcript of this interview, visit the Victorian Aboriginal News website at vicaboriginalnews.com.au. Until our next episode, stay safe and stay informed.